Galatians chapter 5, turn there. And then Daniel chapter 3. So you might want to turn to both places. Appreciate everybody being here. Appreciate, I do. I appreciate uh, Gail coming from Orlando. Galatians and Daniel. We're going to, uh, there's a story. It's going to illustrate what we're talking about this morning. And we're going to talk about this for a while because I think it's very important. Um, Galatians chapter 5. One of my favorite verses in the Bible uh, is Galatians 5.1. Um, and there's just so much there, and I want to spend, you know me, I'm, we're not going to rush through anything in the Bible. Why should we? We've got 1,189 chapters chock full of goodness. So let's get all, I believe in getting all the chicken off the bone. Amen? And then picking up the batter crumbs from the plate when you're done, because that's the best part. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, stand fast. Therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. There's a lot of key words in this verse. The stand fast part, the word fast does not mean in a rapid movement. What it means is like when you fasten something, when you take something and you fasten it like a, with a nail and a hammer, Okay, that's what it means. It means have your, have your feet nailed to the floor so that you don't move. Okay, and I want to, during, during the course of these lessons on standing, I'm going to constantly reinforce the, the, really the one God has called us Everybody's got a different sort of ministry. Maybe you pray, maybe you study, maybe you witness, maybe you minister or whatever. Everybody's got their thing to do, but all of us are required to do one key primary thing in the age that we live in, and it's been that way throughout every age of God's people. God requires them to take a stand. Take a stand. And how, do, how do we use that term? I'll just hear from you for a minute. When I say take a stand, what does that imply? What does it mean? Huh? Stand up for what you believe in. Okay, there was a what, country song, you got to stand for something or you'll fall for anything. Okay, not, not a bad one, not a bad idea. Okay, and uh, what did that come out in the 90s? Something like that. And uh, some of you, you never heard it? Yeah, you got to stand for something or you'll fall for anything. I, I tried to get the twang in there just like he did. Yeah, be your own man, not a puppet on a string. So anyway, but yeah, it means exactly that. It means what you believe in, don't sway away from that, don't budge. And, and if you believe in it, act it out. Every day of your life, you're called to do this thing. It doesn't matter how popular or unpopular it is. And there are, there are always going to be people who are constantly riding the popularity boat. Whatever everybody else goes along with, that's what they go along with because they don't want to make any waves. They don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. They want to be liked. They don't want to make anybody mad. And I admit to you, years ago, that's something that the devil introduced into my mind was as a young pastor here I wanted everybody to like me I, I didn't want to make anybody mad didn't want to make any waves so on and so on and God whipped me for that I mean he whipped me hard for that and uh, so God dealt with me over the years about Mike this is who you are this is this is what I've made you don't be ashamed of that and don't back down from it. Doesn't mean you got to get in everybody's face over it, but don't back down. So now let me illustrate a point. Uh, I'm going to give you one point that's not in the Bible and one point that is in the Bible, but the point that's not in the Bible is still biblical. Okay? When we, when we are wrestling against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places, 
when we're wrestling against them, we are dealing with beasts. Wild animals, beasts. Because that's what these devils are. God did not give them a choice. God created them the way they are. Think of animals. Jesus used the expression, foxes have holes and birds have nests. Can a bird decide if it wants to, to one day move out of the nest and live in a hole? It's not in their nature. They are made the way they are, and they act the way they do. All right? So, we're going to use the Bible as like a Boy Scouts trail guide. Trail guide tells you about the different animals that live in the woods and how to spot where their habitat is or where they have been, how to look for tracks in the dirt. When we go out for deer season, before deer season starts, we're out there, we're looking for a couple things. We're looking for deer tracks. We're looking for scrapes and rubs up against trees. We're looking for bucks to rub off that velvet off of their horns, make them real slick and shiny so the doe will like them, be attracted to them. And that's what you look for. And you find those places, you know that there's deer in the area. So let's say that you're in the woods, you're out in the middle of nowhere, and you see a wolf. Okay? Now, something to remember about beasts that God instilled in them all the way back in Genesis chapter 9. What was that, Josiah? Fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast. Okay? Which is why we can't invite deer to our house to be killed. They don't show up. <clears throat> They're afraid of us. Uh, which is why fish. Uh, my dad used to tell me all the time when I'd go catfishing with him down in the Arkansas River, every time we go visit relatives, dad and my grandpa would be down Arkansas River fishing. I didn't really, I'd fish for about five minutes, and then I'd want to play. And I'd play on these big rocks there that had piled up next to this lock and dam. And Dad would always tell me, get still. Why? Those catfish can tell you're up here. And I never believed him. I thought, my dad is crazy. Them fish can't see me up here. They can't smell me. I know that. So... I thought he was nuts. Years later, we, we got asked to preach for a pastor, and he had a real nice place set up. He had had a, a little cottage built next to their house that visiting preachers would stay in. And down the hill from that little cottage, were, he had two catfish ponds. He was raising catfish for commercial purposes. He would sell the catfish to companies. And he was telling us, now, and Matthew was little then, and he would say, now I'm going to go down and feed the catfish, but I have to go alone. Because if I walk down there, and if my wife is with me, when I throw this food out, they know that she's there and they won't come up and eat it. I went, are you kidding me? He said, no, I'm dead serious. So he, took, he decided he would take Matthew. It was so cute watching Matthew creep down this hill real quiet. And sure enough, he got down to those catfish ponds and he's throwing food out. And the fish are not coming up. They're not touching it. And he said, they know that somebody else is here besides me. And I said, how? He said, they sense it somehow. Probably the whiskers, or that's what the whiskers are for in a catfish. They sense something is there besides me. They're used to me. If I come down alone and throw this food out, it looks like the water is boiling because fish are everywhere. But when he walked down the hill with Matthew, they wouldn't hardly touch it, okay? So keep that in mind, that they, they know when a human being is around. So now, you're facing a wolf in the forest. What should you do? Run? It's the worst thing to do. Why shouldn't you run? A wolf will run faster than a man every day. See, so now man, here's the wolf down here and here's the man up here. Who has the advantage? The man does. The man has the advantage both in height, strength, ability, weapons that he might have. 
man has the advantage. So if the man runs, the wolf is always going to outrun the man, and he's going to bite his heels. And when he bites his heels, the man falls. Now who has the advantage? The wolf does, and the wolf knows exactly where the juggler vein is. And he'll go for the throat every time. While you're laying there screaming, he's biting and chewing at your throat to kill you. Okay? So the best thing to do is stand. Now, they'll growl. Their haunches will come up. They will enlarge themselves to make themselves, the tail get bushy. They'll just make themselves big, and they'll show, you ever seen the dog show its teeth? Like that? That dog is trying to scare you, but there's a reason why that dog is trying to do that. That dog is scared of you, and he wants you to leave. So stand and stare down the wolf. And hopefully, eventually, yeah, I'm shaking my head at this too, Sister Betty. I'm going, uh, I get scared. But that's what they'll tell you to do. Your chances are better that that wolf is going to run off than for you to run because that wolf will catch you. So you take a stand. Take a stand against your enemies. Take a stand against the wolves that come in. Take a stand and don't move. Because God put a fear in that wolf's heart of you. Even if that wolf, even if that wolf has never seen a human image in his life, the moment he sees one, he's immediately afraid. God put it in there. Follow me so far? Now, Christ Devils are not afraid of any of us. But they are afraid of Jesus because they know who he is. When Jesus showed up to someone who was possessed, Jesus, thou son of most high God, what have we to do with thee before the time? In other words, they were freaking out. When Jesus met legion, that legion of devils begged Jesus not to cast them into the deep. They knew the power that he had and they knew they were powerless against it. So Jesus said, fine, what do you want me to do? He said, well, there's a herd of swine over there. Fine, he threw them into the swine. The swine ran into the deep. They ended up in the deep anyway, okay? So that's, when I'm, as I'm telling you this, I'm telling you, God calls us to one thing in this world that we're living in, and that is to take a stand. Don't move away from it. Don't budge from it. So I say to the men of our churches, the men of our families, you're the head of the household, and you're the authority of the household. And as such, then God provides protection to you and your family through you as the head of your household. Where, remember, where authority is, is protection. Okay? I was watching uh, one of these idiots on an interview on Fox News. He is an illegal person in this country, and he's very bold about it. He has formed a group to try to rally all the illegal immigrants into this nation to rise up and demand their rights. Rights is what? Citizens? They're not citizens. And he used the word constituents. He said, we are constituents. And I said, no, you're not. A constituent is someone who is under the Constitution. The Constitution requires that if they come in here, like Hyun Mi did, like Michael did, like um, M Michael's mother did, she came in, she didn't come in on a shipping crate hiding out. She came in with a visa and a passport. She had permission to come in this country legally and we welcome that but not illegally if you are here you've already shown that you will break the laws of this country and the law doesn't matter to you so what you want is you want to come here and live off of everybody else but be exempt from the laws that are meant to protect and the guy the interviewer on fox tucker carlson made a good point he said 
We live under a constitution. That constitution is for us first, the American citizens. Okay? And I want you, if you think that's ungodly and unbiblical, let me remind you that Jerusalem above in heaven has a big wall around it to keep out people who don't belong in there. Sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and drunkards and people who believe and tell lies. They don't belong in there. There are rules. Amen? Okay? So uh, that, just, that just boils me when they come in this country illegally and then demand that we give them everything. But if you want to come in here, come in here the right way, we'll welcome you with open arms. Everybody in this room, your family migrated to this land at one point or another. Amen? Okay? So that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. So here, here is, here's a man, let's say the, the president. The president says, you want to come in this country, come in legally. And he's not budging. There is a gateway into this land. It is called the Constitution. And the president, the vice president, all the members of Congress, all the officers of the armed forces swear an oath to protect and defend what? The Constitution of the United States of America. So that anybody who would come in here illegally, we have to automatically assume that they're not here for our benefit. So here is our armed forces guys, our policemen. By the way, kudos to, uh, who was it, San Diego, I think. Because the sheriff's department said, we will now start cooperating with immigration officials on illegal aliens, in spite of the fact that the liberal politicians declare this city a sanctuary city. Amen! Amen! So you have these guys standing, standing opposed with the sword in their hand, okay? And they're not supposed to let anybody in this nation that would harm us, okay? So what if someone who's standing guard, blocking a way in, did this? They're not doing their job. They're not standing. They move. Okay? I, I use this illustration. I haven't taught this in a long time, but I use this illustration when it comes to the difference between the King James and the New King James and these other translations. This Bible is our Constitution. It is right. It is the agreement that God made with us, and its words are correct. So if somebody wants to come in and change the words, what do I immediately have to think? Are they doing it to make the laws better or to remove them? So for years, a church would use only one Bible, and then they started switching over to the other Bibles. Do you know what they did? They moved. And the verse literally says, stand fast. Don't move. Don't move. Amen? Now, there's a, there's a story, a typology, a prophetic picture of every doctrine in the Bible, which is why I had you go where? Daniel, chapter 3. Turn there. <clears throat> I want you to notice... Verse, well, let's read verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits. How many cubits is that? Three score? Sixty. And whose breadth was six cubits. What do those numbers mean, do you think? Six hundred, three score, and six. This image is a pic prophetic picture of the image of the beast. Okay? And then... He says in verse 4, Then in herald cried aloud to you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you do what? What are you supposed to do when you hear the music? Fall. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2, 
That day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So now, I want you to think about this. Let's say that out in the, in the plain of Dura, which, which is where this is located, it's in a valley. Let's say you got a million people gathered out there for the big unveiling of this statue, this image that Nebuchadnezzar built. And he says, when he sounds the music, I want everybody to fall. Okay, that's your falling away. Now, when they sounded the music, everybody fell except Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What did they do? They stood. What does a renegade... America hater NFL player do when they play the national anthem? What do the decent guys do when they hear the national anthem? See what I'm saying? So how easy is it then on this particular day when they're all gathered out there in the plain of Dura, how easy is it to figure out who's on God's side and who's on the devil's side. It's plain as day because everybody else is laying down on the ground and you've got three that stood. Now, were these guys popular? Not anymore. Whatever favor they had with the king was all tossed out the window on the day that that music sounded and those men stood. And you know the rest of the story. Uh, let's look in. Um, I like what they said. They had a little bit of Holy Ghost attitude in them. Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Verse 17. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. I like that. Because that's like, Nebuchadnezzar, we believe God will save us. But even if he doesn't, we're not bowing down to your image. You don't supposed to tell the king things like that. King gets mad. King can have your head cut off. He can throw you in the fiery furnace. These men... I want you to get this in your mind. For them, it was better to die free than to bow in bondage. There's way, many ways to apply this. Sin, you can apply it to sin. It is better to die in liberty than it is to live in chains amen as americans as americans it is better our forefathers founded this nation on this principle it is better to die as free men than to live in bondage to king george and they said we're not doing it you can shoot us all you want to you can slaughter us but we're not living in bondage ever again. Ask yourself the question, would you like to go back to the old days where sin had its grip on you? Anybody here want to go back to that? I don't. Nobody in their right mind does. They want to be free. Now, sad to say, there are some people who like bondage. They can't be helped. I don't care what you do, they cannot be helped. But those who've ever been free want to remain free. And we don't want to go back to the chains of bondage again. Amen? Uh, I have up on the screen Psalm 130. Look at that. Turn your Bible there very quickly. <clears throat> David said, Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? There's a couple of things here. Notice that he said, mark iniquities. 
He used the word mark. What does that make you think of? Mark of the beast. Absolutely. If thou shouldest mark iniquities. The beast is the man of sin, the son of perdition. And the mark has everything to do with the sinfulness of mankind. And so here's what God's going to do. And there's, there's coming a day. I promise you there is coming a day when people are going to fall and people are going to rise. Those who fall, it is because their iniquities cause them to fall. Those who stand, it will be because of the righteousness of Christ in them, giving them the strength to stand when everybody else falls. Amen? Uh, so turn to 2 Thessalonians 2. We'll illustrate that with Scripture. This is, uh, I, I can pretty much remember the day when I read this and I went, you know what? I don't think the rapture is the first thing that's going to happen. I really don't. I used to, but I don't think that anymore. And here's why. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind. What happens when we get scared? Shake. What happens to our knees? We get feeble. Okay? When we get scared, we get weak. We, wanna, we, wanna, we need to lay down or sit down or something like that. That you be not soon shaken in mind. The Bible says that in that day, God is going to shake the heavens. He's going to shake the earth. And he's doing that so that the things that will stand will remain. The house built upon the rock will endure that. But the house built upon sand, mm -mm. sand, when it is shaken, it flows just like a river. It does. It'll run just like a river. That be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, is that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So think of things in the Bible that fall. Think of things in the Bible that have, have fallen or will fall in the last days. And give me some. False idols, okay? Give me another one. Things that fall in the Bible. Sodom and Gomorrah. The walls of Jericho. They fell, didn't they? At the sounding of what? The trumpets. What'd you say? Angels. Really? Yep, a third of them. Like, like untimely figs falling off the fruit tree when she is shaken of a, my, shaken of a mighty wind. God's going to shake heaven. And when he shakes heaven, all the evil angels are going to fall out of it. That's what's going to happen. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, the temple, the, the, the temple that Solomon built fell. The temple that, uh, that was built after they came back from Babylonian captivity that Herod remodeled. They called it Herod's temple because of that. They were building it 46 years. Jesus said, destroy this temple. Now re but that temple fell. In A.D. 70, that temple fell. Okay, Because God says, I do not dwell in temples made with hands. They're temporary. Okay, Some, Something else that falls in the Bible. You mentioned, you mentioned false idols, Dagon. Remember Dagon? When the, when the Philistines stole the Ark of the Covenant, they took it to the house of Dagon. Dagon is half human, half beast, half fish. He's a hybrid. Okay? And they set it before him, and they come back the next morning, and Dagon has fallen down before the Ark of the Covenant. I love that. Because the ark, the ark is God's throne. Okay, Dagon's going, he's king of kings and lord of lords. So they stood him back up. Boy, that's a powerful God you have. He needs one of those life alert buttons so he can press it when he falls. 
So somebody, I've fallen and I can't get up. Okay, that's some powerful God you've got there. You had to stand him back up. So then the next morning, boom, he falls again. This time he's broken in pieces. Okay, and the Israelites said, we gotta, or the Philistines said, we got to get rid of this ark. We can't, we can't have this. So they sent it back. So things like that, there's, there's going to be a falling. But on that day, God's people are going to stand. Turn to Leviticus 26. Leviticus 26. Yeah, Babylon. <clears throat> you pray for me. I uh, was taking this medicine that keeps me from sweating so bad in my face. And the insurance company decided that it was better for them that they slipped in the generic version of that medicine. So I took that generic version for six months, and it doesn't do diddly. So I asked my doctor, had an appointment this last week, can I, get, can I go back to the, the name brand? And they said, well, yeah, all you got to do is ask. So I asked, and they filled it, but it's going to cost me 400 bucks. And I've, I'm trying to get the doctor's office to appeal with the insurance company because the generic doesn't work. And as this weather warms up, I, I take it to keep from just sweating so bad while I'm speaking. So help me pray about that, all right? Leviticus 26, verse 36. Upon them that are left alive of you, I will send a faintness into their hearts and the lands of their enemies, and the sound of a shaken leaf shall chase them, and they shall flee as fleeing from a sword, and they shall fall when none pursueth. And they shall fall one upon another as it were before a sword when none pursueth, and ye shall have no power to stand before your enemies. Notice how both themes are in this passage here. Leviticus 26, if you want to make notes on this, Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 sort of parallel one another. They're double witnesses. They're warnings that God gave to Israel about their sin. And he says to them, if you don't keep my statutes, my judgments, my laws, my precepts, my commandments, if you don't keep all of these things, God says, I'm going to send things to you you're not going to like. And he says in this passage here, you're going to fall and you will have no power to stand before your enemies. Now, uh, there's a story about this. Because when they, Joshua goes against the city of Ai, his army gets slaughtered because a man by the name of Achan took something out of Jericho that he wasn't supposed to take. Took a garment, Babylonish garment, a wedge of gold, and something else, and he hid it. Ask yourself the question: What good is does it do to steal a coat from Jericho that you have to bury under your tent that you know you can never wear out in public? Because everybody will say, "Where'd you get that Babylonian jacket?" I saw the people in Jericho wearing those. Where did you get yours? Because he'll never be able to wear it ever. Why did he steal it? So anyway. When uh, Joshua's army got beat up at Ai, Joshua goes back before God and is weeping, God, why did you let us? God said, quit your crying, Joshua. Number one, I didn't tell you to go against Ai yet. Number two, there's sin in the camp. And because there's sin in the camp, I will not allow you to be able to stand before your enemies. You're going to run. And that's exactly what he says. You're going you're gonna to run and fall when no one's chasing you. Isn't that something about sin? That unconfessed, unrepented sins, you're constantly looking over your shoulders, wondering who knows about it, wondering who finds out about it, wondering how, how or when it's going to catch up to you. You are running when no one is chasing you. And because of that sin, God says, I will not give you power to stand against your enemies. Who's your enemies? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. You'll have no power to stand against them. 
And the danger is that what you came out of that you wanted God to save you from, God may just turn you right back over to it and it'll be worse the second time than it was the first time. Come on in, sir. Have a seat. Make yourself at home. But that's what he said. You, you'll have, you will have no power to stand before your enemies. God said, I'll let your enemies run right over the top of you. And you'll have no power against them. Okay? Apply that to this country. We got countries all over the world that hate our guts. And we've got people in high places in this country who have been selling out our country Selling out our country. Selling secrets to China for money. That's crazy. Okay? But that's what's been going on. And unless we turn back to God as a nation, God will allow this nation to fall before our enemies. Mm -mm -mm. Turn to 1 Samuel 5. Here, I mentioned this, kind of got ahead of myself, but here's where the Dagon story fits in. 1 Samuel 5, verse 3, When they of Ashdod arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. By the way, when Goliath fell, how did he fall? On his face. Every knee shall bow. Everybody's going to fall before the Lord. Amen. Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord, and they took Dagon and set him in his place again. When they arose early in the morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord and the head of Dagon, and both palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. Now, I got a little theory about this. We know in Daniel 2 that the fourth kingdom is a, is a kingdom of iron and miry clay. And they're welded together. But clay doesn't weld to iron. In other words, they mingle it, but it doesn't stick. It doesn't hold together. It won't work. Remember what Jesus said about a kingdom divided against itself? What will happen to it? It will what? Fall. So, this, all of this, this gold, the silver, the brass, and the iron was all being held up by iron mixed with miry clay. And if that doesn't work, the whole image falls. And it does. The whole image falls and it's ground into powder like the, like the chaff in a threshing floor and the wind just blows it away and it's all gone forever. Okay? So when this, this is, I mean, there's a lot of types in this and a lot of pictures of this, but this is, this is a church that's trying too hard to mingle itself with the world. A church that's trying to be like the world. Trying to sing the world's music in the house of God, which you ought not do. And talk about things in the house of God that should not ever be talked about. Things that should never be said. This is the church trying to mingle itself with the world, and it won't work. That was, I, again, that was something that I tried years ago, and boy, you wouldn't believe the whipping I got over that. First from my mom, and then from God. So, I got it double. But that's, that's the idea of, of, if we get back to Galatians, and then we'll dismiss Galatians 5, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Once you've been made free, it's like someone going to prison. Once you've done your time, and you decided that you don't like going to prison, that's supposed to reform you so that once you get out, you say, I'm not going to go back to prison. And whatever I did to get me in prison, I'm not going to do it. No, you would think that that's how it's, people are supposed to think. But most people, they call it recidivism. When you get out of jail, 
and two days later they arrest you and you're right back in again. They let you out, two days later you're right back in again. Some of these people have proven, at least to the court system, that they don't belong anywhere but in jail. Amen? But as for us, we have no desire to go back to the bondage that we were in at one time. I know I don't. Father, we ask your blessings now on your word. We know, God, that you'll always bless your word. Open it up to our hearts. Father, remind us of where you saved us from and the pit you dug us out of and the things wherein and we fell for back in the days of sin. And Father, we confess before you that we have no power in and of ourselves to stand against the wiles of the devil and to stand strong against sin. So Father, all we can do is rely upon you. Father, just bless us and help us, dear God, to stand, and having done all, to stand. And when the evil day comes, and it will come, to stand also in that day. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. Amen.